Hello everyone and welcome to this month's edition of the Green New York Lunchtime Learning Webinar Series. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time to join us here today. Uh, we talk about a topic that we had uh, scheduled a while out, um, but uh, circumstances have changed, so we've adjusted it a bit. Um, we're going to talk about uh, kind of a different focus than we had originally anticipated, but we've got some really great content for you today. A couple housekeeping things uh, before we get started today. Everybody is on mute when you join. If you do have questions as we go along, please type them into the chat box. Uh, we will get to those at the end of the webinar. So if you do have a question, type it in and we will get to it at the end. Uh, this webinar is also being recorded and we will put a recording of it on the Green New York website afterwards. You can find uh, all uh, recordings of previous webinars as well on that website. A couple other just quick things here. Uh, daylight hour is coming up on June 19th, uh, so that's next Friday from noon to 1 p.m. So whether you're in an office or you're at home, uh, make sure to see if you can maximize the amount of natural light and be able to turn your lights off to conserve conserve energy during that period. And again, that's next Friday, June 19th from noon to 1 p.m. And next month's webinar uh, is going to be on Tuesday, July 14th at noon, and that's going to be on microplastics. So we have another great topic coming up for you as well. And with that, uh, I'm going to uh, hand it over to our co-chair here, Jody Smith-Anderson, to get us started today. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Jody Smith Sanderson. I'm the Director of Sustainability Programs for DASNY. And I've been really engaged with Brendan and others trying to implement a lot of the work of different executive orders in sustainability and resilience and common sense. <laughs> so one of the things that we're going to be talking about today is the common sense of travel. We're going to be looking at um, the topics of staycations, how to choose where to go and what kind of planning things can be helpful, how we can get there, the different ways that are available, and things to pay attention to when you arrive at your location, and some general travel tips. I think that what is um, really important is that COVID has taught us that we need to be aware of how we travel and maximize the things that we know in our own neighborhoods and our own communities. So we're going to start with that point. Um, Brendan and I put this together, and I think he and I both have um, some good experiences that can get your wheels turning as to how you can vacation well and travel well and be sensible well. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. And uh, I don't know why the photo didn't come up on this one. Um, so, yeah. Um, the first thing we wanted to talk about today uh, was staycation. So we know that uh, for the past couple months, uh, most of us have been staying home, we've been staying safe, uh, and for a lot of us, travel is not going to be an option in the near future. Um, this is something that, uh, you know, is a bummer to a lot of us. Uh, I know myself, I like to travel, I get a lot out of it, I get a, um, it's a big part of my uh, kind of life and routines. Um, but I think one of the things that's important as we're getting through our current situation and we're staying safe is figuring out how we can get the most of staying near home. So the biggest thing we wanted to mention here uh, is you want to make things different. Um, if this is a situation where let's say you take a week or two off this summer um, and you kind of just do the same thing you always have, it's uh, I know for myself that would drive me nuts um, and it would <laughs> just kind of reinforce everything that's, uh, you know, kind of going on in the world. I get into a trap of reading the news and, um, you know, so the big thing here is to kind of change things up. Uh, don't fall into the same old routine and think about different things you can do. So the picture that I actually had here uh, was one of <laughs> me in a tuxedo with a cocktail in my apartment um, that, uh, that didn't load on the PowerPoint here. Um, but just a kind of thing, you know, one idea here that uh, we wanted to get over is, uh, you know, there's a lot of restaurants out there now that are uh, doing delivery or takeout that weren't before. So if there is a place you've always wanted to go, uh, this summer during your staycation is a great excuse to order from them. Put on a, you know, a tuxedo or a suit or a dress and, you know, make a fancy occasion out of it. Um, do something a little bit different like that. 
Yeah, I think it's really important to recognize that there are some things from this COVID experience that I actually hope continue in the future. For example, um, more restaurants offering takeout. More restaurants are now putting out street tables and chairs because they're allowed to do uh, open air seating. And I've always wished that more restaurants did that. So you can even make a moment by walking to a local restaurant if you happen to live in a walkable neighborhood and sit outside and enjoy the street traffic and, and observing people and and making up your own, you know, dialogue for what you're seeing on the street. It's kind of fun. My husband and I um, installed, this is uh, not about restaurants, but we installed in our house a, a, a fairly large movie screen in our not so big house. And, um, and we make a big deal out of movie nights by, you know, having real popcorn and setting everything aside. And you could even make it a little campy and designate someone to be an usher. <laughs> yeah, and um, for those of you that had your um, beach book that you had ready to go, um, you know, a, a good thing to do is, is see if you can swing up a hammock in the backyard, read that there, um, and, and think about the other things you really wanted to do. So for myself, one of the things that I've found um, really kind of enjoyable over the last couple of months is discovering the amount of local nature preserves. Um, we're encouraging people to recreate locally. It's a great way to, um, you know, get out of the house uh, safely and to make sure that you can kind of connect with nature as we're going through all of this. Uh, and it's a great way to keep your sanity. <laughs> um, but just, I mean, I'm here in the Capital District and the amount of local nature preserves I've discovered that I had no idea existed has been fantastic. And they're great just little places. So. Uh, that's one thing I would really um, encourage people to look at this summer is just take a look in your own backyard and see what you can find there uh, because there's probably a lot of gems when it comes to getting out into nature. Uh, there's a lot of different, you know, um, kind of there's wildlife management preserves. There's other things. You usually find bird sanctuaries, you know, uh, you name it, you can find it out there. And another thing we just wanted to mention here was this is a great opportunity to try new local products. I know for myself, um, since I'm not eating out as much and I'm cooking a lot more, I've focused on, you know, maybe going to a different grocery store that has uh, different items, seeing if there's different um, farmers that are selling local things, uh, and maybe even spending a little bit more money on that stuff because I'm not spending the money going out to eat as often. So that's another thing to consider is uh, see what you can find in the way of local products to try. And I think just to wrap up this slide, it's really important, I think, if you're intending your stay at home to be a vacation period, it really is, and we mentioned this earlier, important to make it different from your everyday stuff. So if that means um, indulging in a long, relaxing breakfast, setting aside the social media stuff for your vacation, any trigger that you can remove that pulls you back into your normal reality will make your staycation more of a, a freedom from stress and a, and a true break. Yeah, and the, the, just the last thing we wanted to emphasize here is um, for those of you who are fans of a uh, certain sitcom from the uh, early to mid-2000s uh, here in 2010, uh, is treat yourself. Um, just set aside a day and say, is there something you've always wanted to do, something you, you know, as Jody mentioned, do you want to just sleep in and then get breakfast in bed or, um, you know, any number of things. So, um, you know, think about that. If there's anything you've ever wanted to do or try that's local, just go for it. Treat yourself. So the next thing we wanted to talk about here um, was kind of planning for future trips. Since I know a lot of us, while we're staying home, have more time and we can't travel right now, we're probably thinking about where we want to go, what our bucket list trip would be and things like that. So we wanted to give you some tips here to make sure that that's as, more, as sustainable as possible. And the first thing we wanted to mention here, uh, once we start to come out of the COVID crisis, is avoiding travel hotspots. So, uh, all of us have seen with the rise of especially Instagram and other social media platforms that we're seeing overcrowding in a lot of our, um, our tourist areas. So you look at Venice where they're looking at ticketing people to come into the city and limiting how many can go in. Um, you know, closer to home, the Adirondack High Peaks on a holiday weekend, we have massive crowds uh, and you're not going to get the experience that you really are looking for. So. Think about where you want to go and when you're doing that planning, how you can avoid the hot spots. 
uh, and, and look at if there are other ways, if those are the places you really have your heart set on, can you go off peak? Um, uh, and just one more tip with that, you know, if you are looking someplace that involves kind of airfare, um, you know, Tuesdays are a really good uh, good day to fly. I've found that to be less crowded and usually a lot cheaper too. Yeah, one of one of the things is really just illustrated in the in the photograph too. If you can actually turn some of the the normal stuff into more fun things, if you're willing to 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 ramp up the adventure, I have always gone to the Troy Farmers Market from Albany, but last year and this year I started bicycling there on Saturdays. Uh, and they still have a farmer's market going on now, even though it's a little smaller. So I bike what, what ends up being about 24 miles round trip. And I just make a whole morning of it and enjoy getting flowers and carrying them back on my bike. And it, it becomes less of a task and more of a, a little vacation, a little bit of travel. So those kind of things are, are good to explore too. Also, when you go someplace that's normal for you to go, maybe maybe you can experience it, as we mentioned, in a different way. Like kayaking is awesome, but doing a sunset kayak trip can have an entirely different feel. Or maybe if you go out just before dawn, you'll see different animals than you would when you go after work on a Friday, quote unquote, or over the weekends as you normally did. And that's assuming you have access to bikes and kayaks, but there are also other ways to do any kind of shopping by walking to your grocery store or um, choosing places to go and maybe go there without a car and do things differently while you're there. So this a couple really other notes on, oh, go ahead, Jody. No, it's all you, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> no worries. Um, so the other thing we wanted to talk about here was planning, and Jody really just touched on on the big thing we wanted to talk about was think about where you're going. If there's ways that you can experience the neighborhoods differently in a more sustainable manner. So one of the things that I've really enjoyed is kind of the rise of these micro mobility uh, services like uh, bike share, scooter shares. Um, I don't even know what you would call that thing that I'm riding there. Um, a sit scooter, I guess. Um, but but think about when you're when you're planning your trip. Think about um, are there ways you can get around without having to rent a car? That's going to save you some money. Um, and then think about how you can get around the neighborhoods because a lot of times the most uh, the best travel experiences I've had are when I'm just wandering around or I'm biking around and I'm able to see how people are you know living their life in that place and take advantage of that. Uh, you'll discover some great restaurants, breweries. Um, and other stuff like that too. So think about ways that you can incorporate, uh, you know, sustainability into where you're going and what you're doing while you're there. Yeah, and there are some key points to that. I think it's really important to uh, cut yourself some slack. Make sure that when you get a bike or you're using a scooter that you haven't used before, an electric scooter, for example, um, that you you take the time to understand what you're using, that you 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 don't do it in the stress of the moment. You don't say, oh my gosh, I need to get to the other side of town in this town in which I've never been before. And I'm gonna take this electric scooter that I've never ridden before and I don't know how to get there. Make sure you give yourself time. And part of that is loading the app to access those uh, resources ahead of time. There's nothing like seeing those very, very tempting city bikes sitting there and and then not knowing how you're going to access them and the time ticking away as you're downloading the app and standing right next to the bike that you really want to use. So just take a few minutes to see what's available. The last, and I, granted conferences are going to change now, but the last four or five cities I've been in for conferences, I have made a point to, before the conference week, load up the apps for whatever a bike share or scooter share or walking tour access there is in the city that I could find. And then I've tried at least one of those things in each of those cities. And it changes how I remember those cities and what I like about them. And it gives me a, a sense of my own, like I have control over my own life that way somehow. Yeah, agreed 100%. Yeah. So a couple of the things on the planning front here, 
Um, the first is to look for green hotels and eateries when you're doing your planning here. On the hotel front, the industry as a whole is definitely uh, incorporating sustainability more than they have in the past, and there's a lot of changes being made. Uh, one program that you can look for there is the TripAdvisor Green Leaders Program. That's a really good one to look for when you're looking for green hotels. Uh, another program that's out there uh, that's a third-party certification is the Green Restaurant Association. So if you're looking for restaurants to eat at that are uh, taking steps to become more sustainable, that's a really good option to look for as well. And just make sure you try and build that in. As, as uh, we talked about on the last slide here, um, you know, is there kind of a bike share place near there? Does the hotel have EV chargers if you're driving, you know, renting an EV or something like that? Um, just try and take all this into it, um, into account when you're doing your planning. Yeah, and I think building on that, um, when you arrive at your hotel or wherever you're staying, let them know you picked them because of those sustainable attributes. It's really surprising to me uh, how many people at the front desk of a hotel don't even realize they have EV charging stations until I tell them <laughs> that that's why I'm there or why I didn't pick the hotel across the street. Um, the same thing with every time, I'm a, I, I really believe that, that it takes, you know, many people asking many times for a, a hotel chain to all of a sudden realize that they should have EV charging stations or they should provide walking tours of the city in which they're housed. We're starting to reintroduce to the industry that people are the focus and community is the focus and the best way to get people connected in a tourist fashion or in a visitor fashion is to give them access on foot to more in the city that's being visited. The, the one key point on the, on the TripAdvisor Green Leaders Program, um, I, I have a problem I, and I'm trying to, you know, every time I go there, I, I kind of tell them, hey, can you rework this? You can't really search on green hotels, which is unfortunate. You can find the hotels that you're familiar with and then look to see if they are a green leader. But you can't just say, hey, I'm going to Chicago. Tell me the all the green leaders program hotels that are in this price range. So I'm hoping that over time we'll get to that level. Yeah, that's a really good point. So a couple of thoughts on how to get there when you're doing your planning. Um, the We've got another chart here on the next slide. Um, but when you're looking at sustainable ways to get there, there's obviously some places where you, you're only going to be able to take a plane there. I don't even know if steamerships exist if you wanted to go to Europe, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but the most efficient way you're going to want to get there in the lowest emissions is going to be either by train or bus through uh, public transit usually is going to be the lowest. Um, and then driving or taking a plane as well. And one of the great things about the train, I've been taking that a lot more both for work and, um, well, pre-COVID, um, and for other trips that I make, is the fact that it's a great way to get a new perspective. Um, you know, a lot of us have driven the throughway quite a bit, but if you have to go to Buffalo for something, um, you know, taking the train is actually really beautiful. You get to see a lot more of the countryside. You get to relax. You can move around a little bit more. You can bring snacks with you. Um, and so, you know, it, think about whether or not that's an option for you. As an example here, if you were to fly to Washington, D.C., um, you know, you're going to have to get to the airport early, you're going to have to park, then you're going to have to go through security, and then you're going to have to wait. Then once you get there, you're not ending up right in the city center, so you're going to have to um, either take a train or a bus or a taxi into the city. And so at the end of it, usually a train's going to be time competitive compared to a flight. It's just when you see that upfront, it's this much longer versus like an hour in the air. Um, but once you take everything into account and the fact that you end up right in the city, a lot of times it'll be pretty comparable. So uh, depending on where your next trips are going to be, it's, it's a great, uh, a good way to go about it is to see if there's another way to get there and look at what the time difference is. Yeah, and the photograph on this slide is uh, my husband and I playing cribbage on our trip to Montreal, our, our train trip to Montreal. And that would be pretty near impossible to comfortably do on a plane. <laughs> the only um, qualifier that I have right now about train travel is the, the 
the food service, it's like Amtrak doesn't recognize so much that food is also part of the experience. The food is tasty, but it's all individually wrapped. So we put on this slide control of your own sustenance because you have the opportunity uh, to buy food before you get on the train and it might actually engage, involve less wrapping or you might pack your own food, simple things like like uh, almonds and clementines and bottles of water. Whether you're on a train or a bus or a, a plane or a car, you can take those things with you. The important thing is to remember to empty liquids before you go secu through security at the airport, and then you can fill them up again afterwards and bring them onto the plane with you. So that's always a good approach. And we'll talk about that a little more later as well. Mm -hmm. And one last tip here on uh, flying is if you are going to fly, see if you can get a direct flight. I know from some of our smaller uh, airports, uh, Syracuse, Albany, it might be a little more difficult, but most emissions from a flight come from takeoff and landing. Uh, and when you're cruising, that's usually when it's at its most efficient. So if you get a flight from, or a connector flight from Albany to Newark to get to where you're going, uh, there's gonna be a lot more emissions per passenger uh, because of all the takeoff and landing emissions than if it was a longer flight um, out of somewhere else. So just think about that when you're planning as well. So here's that chart that I was mentioning from. This is from uh, the BBC. Uh, and you can see here, uh, as I was mentioning, the uh, short here, they call it domestic flight since it's for the UK, and then long haul flight. Um, you'll see the long haul emissions are actually less. And then you've got the different modes of transportation here. Um, and you can see that rail, usually rail and bus is going to come in as uh, is the best uh, when we're looking at traveling. I actually really love on this chart that they d differentiate between a car with one passenger and a car with four passengers. There's something that we didn't cover on, in this um, travel uh, webinar. We didn't talk about traveling with friends. And I think that, that that's something that just struck me now. And um, it reminds me of a uh, Michener book, Space, where there's a whole discussion about who can be the navigator and ha who's, who's really good at traveling with other people. It can be an entirely different understanding of your friendship or your, your family dumb if you get in a car together and travel for a shared vacation. And that reduces emissions. It increases your fun level. And, um, and really can change your friendship ratios as well. I totally agree with that. And if there's ways you can carpool, if you have groups coming from different areas, that's another great option as well. There's nothing, um, you know, nothing saying you can't meet halfway between where you're going and, uh, and you can carpool from there. Friends and I actually do that in the Adirondacks. We will, I'll meet them um, halfway up at exit 15 and then we'll take one car from exit 15 uh, up into Keene. And it, it's more fun. It, it adds safety because if one of us is overly tired, we've got plenty of drivers. And it reduces emissions and reduces the burden on the Adirondacks with cars. Very true. So a couple other things here um, at the accommodation. So once you get there, I. Uh, present to you this picture um, as of uh, what not to do for a continental breakfast. Um, everything in there is individually wrapped, even though it's behind the glass and with tongs. I don't know what the future is going to look like of things like continental breakfasts or buffet breakfasts or things like that. There probably will be a lot more individually wrapped stuff uh, going forward due to the COVID crisis. Um, but just a couple things to think about here is I really like this free is not free. So one of the things you can do is bring your own toiletries, especially if you're using things like bar shampoo or bar uh, soaps already. You can just put those in a little tin and bring those with you uh, so you don't have to use those small little plastic bottles of shampoo or lotion or other things like that. Um, and the same thing with a lot of times they'll put a single-use water bottle uh, in a hotel room where they'll offer you one at the beginning. Um, you know, that's another thing where you're just going to end up creating waste. So if you can pack your own... Uh, water bottle and you're able to fill that, that's going to make a big difference as well. A couple other tips here, um, ask for your sheets to be changed every two or three days um, if that's possible. A lot of hotels are now actually moving to that model um, and reusing your towels as well. So if you just keep those on the rack, a lot of times they're not going to uh, launder those for you. 
Yeah, I think it's it's really interesting because somebody coming into this webinar and hearing us say, you know, don't use these amenities that are at the hotel, uh, it might seem like you're not getting value for your money. It's an understanding of what exactly is that short-term value. If, if part of your experience is using a different kind of shampoo that you might think is more luxury than what you normally use at home, or taking a slightly longer shower than normal, then you have, then, then that's part of your vacation experience. That's, that's something, that's a perfectly fine choice. What we're trying to say, I think, is to just think about these things and make sure that it is adding to the experience of your travel or adding to the experience of your vacation. I find that I'm much happier when I have my own lotion and shampoo with me because then I know how my skin's gonna react. I know how much I need to bring. I know, you know, I, I smell like me. <laughs> Uh, so I don't I don't use those um, those provided items. I think I went through a phase where I took every single small bottle of shampoo and lotion and conditioner from every single hotel room I stayed in, and I had a big drawer of them in my house. And my plan was whenever we had guests come over to stay that I'd put out nice little soaps and lotions for them to use, which I don't know if we never had any guests or I never bothered to put them out. I finally packaged up all of those tiny little wasteful bottles and mailed them just after the hurricanes uh, in, in, and sent them off to Puerto Rico, hoping that they would be of use to someone instead of sitting in a drawer in my house. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. And one last tip with this slide here is always make sure to have, a, if you're a coffee drinker, have a mug with you. A lot of hotels have uh, usually coffee in the lobby, so you can just get it as, um, get it to go there in your own mug. So a couple other general travel tips here. Um, the first one here, you'll see uh, bring a travel waste reduction kit. I've started keeping one in my car and in my messenger bag, so I've got uh, one with me at all times. You can have utensils, straw, cloth napkin, water bottle, coffee mug, uh, and nowadays um, some hand sanitizer as well. Those are the big ones that you're going to want to have with you. and. A lot of times, I've, you know, when I'm traveling, I've run across a food truck or a takeout place uh, that I really want to try, and once they give you everything, you look at the, usually the, um, the utensils come wrapped individually in plastic. They are plastic. There's usually a massive handful of napkins. Usually the containers are, are throwaway, uh, or they don't have recycling, and they've been contaminated with the food that you're eating from. So that trip to the food truck is fantastic, and it tastes amazing, but there's the guilt of all the waste that you've got there. So this little kit that I've put together has made a huge difference. And you can see there with the other picture, the uh, always having a coffee mug, no matter where you're staying, you can just fill it up. Yeah, I think that it's also um, important to make the point that that we're, we're giving these suggestions, I would say, as guilt-free suggestions. It's the world is not an all or nothing, nothing place. So if you go to a food truck and you have this kit with you and you happen to be able to avoid uh, one set of throwaway, throwaway, disposable, whatever, plastic that will last forever utensils, you have made, you know, one thing a little better in that moment and you should embrace that. Um, there have been times when I have forgotten my kit in the car and I'm, I actually didn't drive the car someplace. I rode my bike and I didn't have my utensils. And I felt guilty about using what was provided. Uh, I, over time, I've gotten better at keeping things with me. And I think we have to focus on celebrating the achievements we make. And then you get more comfortable with having your own things with you. The tip that I put on here was a large cloth scarf. I have this really big, it's not really a pashmina, it's a little lighter, um, almost a shawl. And it's a scarf for most of the time. But the other day when I biked to Troy with my husband, uh, we wanted to have a Brugger's bagel and just sit out in the park, so we spread out that scarf as a picnic blanket, and it was versatile. And then when I travel on planes or trains, typically there's a there's a forced breeze in the plane or train, and it, it gets a little chilling. But if you have a very simple scarf that you can lay over you, it doesn't have to be a heavy blanket. It just stops that breeze and makes you much more comfortable. Or you can put it over your face so that no one can see you drool while you're sleeping. That's a good tip, too. <laughs> so a couple other um, just tips here. Uh, the first one, this uh, I really like this one. 
is be conscious when eating out. Normally when we're going back to a hotel room or somewhere else, uh, we're not going to be having room for take or, uh, for leftovers with us. Um, so make sure that you're ordering. I know that my eyes are always bigger than my stomach, especially when I've been, you know, busy all day while traveling and want to try everything. Um, but if you have a group of people, consider getting a bunch of small plates so you can try different yeah. things uh, and know that usually you're not going to end up eating the leftovers. So uh, try and be conscious of that. Yeah, and you travel is all about kind of maintaining your own entertainment and you can do it a whole bunch of different ways of course your own you know movies and stuff like that you can also um prepare to access some sudoku and some word puzzles make sure you load the content before the travel day because the last thing you want to be doing is uh you know in the airport waiting to get onto your flight and and using the same wi-fi that a million other people are using with their, the, the charges that happen in some places. So do it before. Um, use your own headphones and ear pods. It's much nicer than, than relying on whatever is, is handed out, and some, some airlines still do either hand them out or charge for them. Library books are great. I would suggest then also just keeping in mind that, that you might actually talk with somebody <laughs> on this travel day and, and bring along your curiosity and your goodwill because sometimes the people that you encountered are actually as valuable in the travel day as anything else you'll experience. I agree with that 100 percent. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, some of the best travel experiences I've had have been just talking to random people and you end up finding a lot of, uh, a lot of really interesting things that way if you're searching for. Um, and that's one way to end up in a, uh, a metal concert in Norway that you had no idea was happening, but you can end up <laughs> in some interesting places. <laughs> Wait, that happened to um, you too? Brandon, that happened to you yeah. too? Yeah, oh, it did, yeah. <laughs> this, this wall of sound coming at me from uh, angry Norwegians. Um, yeah. Didn't see that happening in the back of the bar. Um, <laughs> um, some tips with reusables in the TSA. Um, you can take reusable utensils through security, uh, but no serrated knives. Um, and bamboo or durable plastic, if you have that, is going to be safer to make sure that that does get through. You can empty your water bottles and coffee mugs and bring them with you. Um, you can see here that's a mug that I had uh, filled with the Starbucks at the Albany Airport uh, Starbucks there after security. They just put my iced coffee in it. Um, and a lot of airports now are putting in the water bottle filling station, so it's a lot easier than having to uh, fiddle around with a uh, drinking fountain. Uh, and if you are a knitter, make sure that you plan accordingly uh, with your uh, with your yeah. uh, knitting needles and everything. I think the big thing about knitting is is more the, the the scissors that you might bring with you. I have never had any of my knitting needles um, taken away from me, but I have lost three or four pairs of scissors before I started to really pay attention. Uh, as a, in a pinch, just throw in some nail clippers because the nail clippers can get through the yarn and then you never have a, an issue with whether your scissors are too big or not. Yeah, that's a great tip. <laughs> so with that, we're going to take some questions here. So if you have any tips yourselves, uh, type them in that we didn't talk about today, type them into the chat box and we'll, uh, we can read those off and share them with everyone as well. Um, thank you again for joining uh, today's presentation, uh, and let's uh, let's get to the questions here. Yeah, Brandon, uh, can I just say one thing before you get into the Oh, yeah, discussion? go for it. Yeah. yeah, no, just as a summary, as we were talking, I mean, Brandon and I discovered some of our stories as we were talking, but we also planned a few of them. Um, I think that what I see as the trends, it's, uh, it's, it's looking ahead and making sure you, you uh, address your own comfort. And, and take responsibility for your own comfort. That's kind of step one in traveling greener. And I think step two um, is really understanding a community basis. What, you're, what you can, how you can be more successful is by connecting better with others, be it through carpooling or through planning, and through connecting with the place that you're going in a way that's not strictly limited to the standard tourist approach. So those two things, I think are really key elements in traveling greener. Yep. 
So the the quest, so we have a couple questions that have come in here. The first one is, what is a coach versus a bus that was on the slide with the travel options and emissions? So a coach usually refers to an inner city bus, one that has the nicer seats, uh, as opposed to a city bus. So if you've ever gone, uh, taken any of the like Greyhound or any of those, uh, or Peter Pan or any of those services, um, those are usually coach buses, uh, or if you've ever chartered a bus, uh, or the Northway Express is one as well that's coaches versus regular buses. Um, how is Eurostar that low? Is the number masking moving the tailpipe? I am not sure about that one. Um, I know the Eurostar is electrified, so they might have been referring to Britain does still have a lot of uh, diesel trains. They haven't electrified as much as the, the rest of Europe, so that could be a situation where that's referring to uh, potentially an electrified rail line versus a diesel rail line. We got a comment here. Um, there are a lot of local nonprofits that love those little bottles for healthcare kits that they make for those in need. And an example of that is uh, to love a child in Clifton Park. So if folks do have any of those toiletries, like when Jody mentioned how she donated hers to uh, the folks in Puerto Rico after the hurricanes, uh, there are a lot of nonprofits that take those as well. So this could lead to some good uh, cleaning out of drawers as well. <laughs> A um, couple folks have also made great friends at the airport. Um, so here's one. How do you check if a hotel is green? Is there a cost factor? Is there a cost factor going to a greener hotel uh, or an EV rental? That's a Jody, great question. Do you have thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's it, it really, as I mentioned, TripAdvisor should be easier to use than it is um, really. At this point, the way I do it is I go to the hotels online that I normally go to through TripAdvisor and then just see if they have any, any sustainability attributes or if they're registered as a green leader. Um, ideally, I'd like TripAdvisor to eventually make that a searchable feature, which I think will encourage a lot of change. Uh, to my knowledge, I haven't seen any, any hotels that have have any higher pricing point, even if they're a green leader. It's the, the, the irony is that there is a process in, in becoming greener, but if it's done right, it actually will save them money in their operations. So I think this is becoming more of a business benefit and then an added marketing strategy. Um, the EV chargers, things like that, they, I think any hotels that don't start, at least in urban environments, that don't start to offer those things are going to be in trouble as we, as we move forward because um, we, we're we not going backwards anymore. <laughs> yeah, and with that, I'll add one of the reasons we talk about the, the TripAdvisor program here is within New York State's green purchasing specifications, we encourage state employees to look for a hotel that is rated through that TripAdvisor program when booking uh, trips for state work. So that's why we mentioned that we vetted that program uh, and it, that's why we do go through there. So just so you know, if you yeah. are traveling for work, that is the way that the, the green purchasing specification is listed is you should look for a hotel uh, that meets the price point that uh, for the area you're traveling in that is a member of that, uh, participates in the TripAdvisor Green Leaders Program. Yeah, and actually that's a good point, Brendan. We had um, DASNY, I wrote a letter to all the hotels that DASNY normally sent people to, and the letter said, we are interested in purchasing sustainable um, lodging. Please tell us your sustainable attributes, um, or if you're registered with Green with TripAdvisor's Green Leaders Program, and then we were able to to make some decisions. Now, granted, most of them didn't answer until they got a phone call and we pestered them to answer. But that's another way to send the signal, at least through your work. Um, and maybe you can start to think that way when you're, if you happen to frequent a hotel, then you can start to make that hotel sustainable, more sustainable just by asking them questions that, that help them realize the importance of it. You know, yeah, past questions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and 
you know, we tend to think of advocacy as something that you do and you petition your local or state or federal government to do something, but really consumer advocacy is becoming more and more important as well in this realm. And I think that's why you're seeing a lot of the hotels and restaurants starting to adopt a lot of these things. So anything you can do to let them know uh, that you care makes a big difference. I, and I've never had anybody give me a bad response to me saying, oh, you're green, that's great. Um, it just kind of reinforces it. Or if there's something that you think they should be doing or could, you know, you could point that out to them as well. Um, so somebody asked if we could put this, this slide back up with the emissions from different modes of transport. So I put that up right here. Um, so here, is there a list of bike-friendly cities? Our friendly went to Buffalo and only traveled by bike the whole weekend, and the kids are still talking about it over a year later. That That's is fantastic. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah, um, the League of, is it the League of American Bicyclists, Jody, that, that publishes their rankings of various cities based on bike friendliness? You know what, I actually don't even know. You caught me flat footed okay. on that one. Yeah, Yeah, I, I think it's the League of American Bicyclists. So if you look up that organization, they actually give a ranking to various cities based on their bike infrastructure. Um, and there's, there's probably a couple other ones out there as well. Um, but that's going to give you a pretty good um, idea of that. And then, of course, there's your, your general leaders. Um, I was in Portland, Oregon not too long ago, and um, some of the stuff they're doing is absolutely incredible. Uh, but most cities are jumping on this bandwagon because, as Jody said, you know, we're not going back, and this is the, the wave of the future. So um, yeah. I, I would take a look at that. Um, do. Um, somebody asked, can you share responses to the DASNY letter requesting information on green policies with, with a certain person? Yeah, um, I, I, I saw that, that chat. This was done probably eight or nine years ago. So it did inform, like we actually reached out to, I think, two hotels at that time and said, unless we see some changes, we're not going to recommend you. Um, I would like to revisit that at DASNY. It's because I think it would be much more successful now in in creating awareness and in refining some of our travel policies at DASNY. We've got a lot to manage. We have um, way too many hotels on our list and way too many options uh, that are are beyond a close distance to where we need to go. So it's a great question. I'll let you know mm -hmm. once we do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we got a question here regarding serrated bamboo knives on airplanes. I have not yeah. had trouble taking mine through before, um, but with anything TSA, a lot of times there's some discretion depending on how it looks and how it functions and and uh, and stuff like that. So it's actually with all this my, stuff. Sorry, it's oh, actually my oh, experience ahead. that the metal that the it, it, I. The serrated metal butter knives, there are serrated metal butter knives. I've had two of those taken away. I thought because they were metal butter knives, they would be fine. They were serrated, and so they were taken away. Make sure if you have a metal utensil that it's not serrated. I don't think that that issue would come up with bamboo or plastic, um, but it does definitely, it is the great divider as far as metal knives. Mm -hmm. So here's a really great tip that came in, is if you go to a nature preserve, take great photos and send them to friends who might be housebound or who live in a more crowded area where they can't comfortably social distance at their local park. It's a way to share nature along with them. Um, that, that's fantastic and that's a really good idea. Um, so other things in here. Um, yeah, somebody mentioned that in terms of you know, uh, the current COVID crisis and situation and traveling, everybody is going to have a different risk tolerance as stuff begins to open up and rules begin to get relaxed a little bit. There are a lot of um, online guides as to what the latest thinking is in terms of the risks of various activities. So, you know, until we get to a point where there's a vaccine um, or there's some sort of herd immunity, I don't think it's ever gonna be 100% safe to do, you know, just about anything, but um, everybody's going to have a different risk tolerance and, and a good way to go as things open up is to search for those um, resources online about different activities and the risk levels and, and figure out what you're comfortable with. Yeah, and the same rules will apply for a long time and just, you know, 
wash your hands often, cover your mouth and nose, uh, and maintain distance. I think that, actually I know that, many health researchers have been touting going to parks and being outdoors, outdoor air, and being physical. It does things for your mental state. It also supports your health. It gives you a chance to travel and experience your own neighborhood in essence. And those three things would still apply. Wash your hands, cover your nose and mouth, and maintain distance. Yep. Yeah, I agree. I've been doing a lot of out, much more outdoor stuff this year um, than I normally have this time of year. And uh, it's still, you know, I always keep the, the mask around my neck in case you're going to go past people on the trail and, uh, you know, keep the hand sanitizer ready. Yeah. So does anybody have any other questions or um, comments? Feel free to type them into the uh, chat box here and we can go through those. Um, while, while we're waiting for anything final to come in here, Jody, do you have any final thoughts for folks? No, I, uh, just that I think travel is a really good thing and we will get back into it. And it can be an even better thing when we do it with a little more attention to eliminating waste and amplifying our connection to that new experience. Yeah, and that's, that's the big thing. And I think traveling with a purpose is going to be more, as you were kind of mentioning there. I know for myself, I like to travel a lot, and I'll, I'll all of a sudden see either, you know, cheap flights or, you know, cheap packages or cheap hotels somewhere, and I'm like, oh, I, I need to go do that. That's cheap. And it's like, well, do you really want to go there, or would you rather, you know, maybe take a few, uh, take fewer trips but have them be more meaningful? So right. I think like most stuff that's happened during this COVID crisis, you know, kind of reevaluating, you know, what our priorities are, what we really want to do and really want to see and get the most out of. Uh, travel is definitely one of those. So let me just take a quick scan here, see if we have any uh, further comments or questions. Mm -hmm. And not seeing any, I want to thank everybody for joining today's webinar. Our next one, as I mentioned, is going to be on Tuesday, July 14th on microplastics. Uh, we're really excited for that one because it's a topic that you see in the news quite a bit, uh, and we're going to break it down for you and what you can do uh, to help uh, with that, that issue there as well. So hope everybody stays well. I hope you and your families are staying safe, uh, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, everybody.